MyFantasySportsTalk.com. What up, what up, what up? This is my fantasy podcast from MyFantasySportsTalk.com. And I always say we have a big show planned for you today. But today, we actually have a huge show planned for you. It's going to be <laughs> great. It's going to be huge. Breaking huge. news. Huge, always. It's true. It's true. Breaking news coming out of the NFL yesterday leading to a big announcement today. We'll get into that in just a moment. Also, just learned about a big trade that went down just moments ago involving a huge name. Another huge news there. We'll also be talking NFL free agency as the look of NFL franchises are about to change over the next couple of months, especially your Super Bowl champs. We're also going to be talking NCAA bubble watch with selection Sunday approaching just six days away. One of the most exciting times of the year for uh, for sports fans, no doubt. And before the end of this show, we're going to tell you who we have as the number one seeds in this year's big dance. It is Monday, March 7th, 2016. Let's start the show. I am Brandon Reed, lead writer for MyFantasySportsTalk.com. Let me bring in the founder of MyFantasySportsTalk.com, Dan Schalk, and lead contributor of MyFantasySportsTalk.com, Kyle Kirby, DSKK. How's it? What's going on, guys? Want to be huge. Huge. Too much. It's huge. Too much to talk about today. It's it's beyond huge. Uh, we just learned about a trade that went down, sending a superstar running back to a new home. We'll talk about that in just a little bit. But of course, the big news coming out of yesterday, leading to a huge announcement today. I think that's going to be the theme of the show today. Huge, <laughs> big announcement today. Of course, as uh, many of you heard, I'm sure. Peyton Manning decides to retire and hang it up after 18 years. Number 18 is done. Uh, just so, just uh, right off the top, what do you guys think? Uh, it's it's a sad day for for football, football fans in general. Uh, the game uh, it hasn't quite sunk in yet for me. Um, I know uh, you know Peyton came at the 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 time where I was very impressionable as a football fan and. Uh, watching him play his entire 18-year uh, career um, and seeing it end is is bittersweet, and it, I'm not sure it's completely sunk in yet. Yeah, it's a uh, it's definitely a sad day for football, but as a Patriots fan, it's a fantastic day for me. The uh, scourge of my team is now done. Nah, I, I respect Peyton. I, I definitely uh, it, he's definitely had a big impact on the game. I, I think one of the things that you know I've read a lot about and kind of recognize myself as you know he kind of ushered in this era of pass happy you know kind of all the time kind of football and you know he that, that definitely means a lot that's, that's the kind of football that I enjoy the most so I you know I, I, it's going to be a different league without Peyton and I think well and Kyle your New England Patriots are one of the few teams that got the better of Peyton in his career um for the majority of the time you know so they're, they're one of the teams that had success of course, uh, you know, him and Tom Brady have had sort of linear careers, yeah. uh, Peyton hanging it up, and uh, Tom Brady just recently signing a three-year extension looking to, to, to battle on. But uh, Peyton was the first pick in the 1998 NFL draft. Man, it seems like forever ago. Uh, huge star at Tennessee. His record at Tennessee in the Volunteers was 39-6 and six overall. Uh, we knew we knew we were going to have big things out of Peyton Manning coming into the NFL, but do you guys remember just how close the decision was between Peyton and, and Ryan Leaf? Oh, um, my the God. Si- the decisions made back then. Now, how did that turn out? I Pretty well for, for the Colts. <laughs> exactly. That's exactly what <laughs> yeah. I was going to say. It could have been disastrous, right? Oh, God. That was yeah. uh, Ryan Leaf. Just- I remember Ryan Leaf towards the end of his uh, illustrious career with uh, my Dallas Cowboys, and uh, I'm pretty sure that might have been the glory of his career. And I don't even remember that, Dan. Yeah, it was, sadly I do. It's it's uh, burned into my brain. <laughs> so how many games did he play as a Cowboy? Uh, he came in. He he probably played five, but hmm. uh, they were they were ugly five. That was when the uh, the the Chad Hutchinson era. Ryan Leaf, it was just a, a whole ugly mess of the Cowboys, so we won't even get into that. But uh, with 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 Peyton, uh, just uh, 
if you if anybody listened to his speech, I mean, I think that was a that was a great speech, super heartfelt. Um, it was. You know, you could you could see uh, him holding back tears the entire time before he even said a word. I thought he was going to lose it, um, and I, I I thought it was a great way for him to end. But you can you can see he's going to miss the game, um, and uh, he's going to the game is going to miss him. Well, I think that's a good point, and I, I, you know, a lot of the rumors going into this week coming up was that he wasn't actually looking to retire. I heard a couple of things of saying that he was kind of getting mad at the media, felt like they were forcing him to retire. Then I heard that, you know, there was no teams that really wanted him. I'm not sure what the truth is to that, but it wouldn't surprise me because you're right; he loved the game of football, and even if he knew he didn't have that ability like he did a couple of years ago to really sling it. You know, he he definitely he definitely still loved the game. He had a passion for it, and you're right. The speech was great. When I also was listening to the NFL Network today, and former uh, teammate and punter for a long time, Pat McAfee, was talking about Peyton and talking about Peyton knew everyone's role. He knew everyone from even the parking lot attendants uh, to the concession stand workers. He was he was fully involved in whatever organization he was with and knew the role and knew what everyone should be doing and that's just the kind of leader he was you know just just class personified uh, humble even to the last day and making his retirement speech today and just a great leader and you know I don't think we'll ever see anyone like him in the game again just the way he commanded his offense at the line of scrimmage no one broke down defenses like Peyton Manning and just you know, some some of the NFL ranks, it's 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 unbelievable. It is unbelievable. First in pass yards, first in pass TDs, first in MVPs, first in Pro Bowls, first in three plus TD games. That's remarkable. Mm-hmm. First in four thousand yard seasons, first in game winning drives, first in playoff appearances. I mean, who who is ever going to top those numbers? That is unbelievable. No one, no one, and that's the point too. And and. And the numbers are awesome, but like you said before, it was a lot of the intangibles that made Peyton different. You know, his numbers were great, but he was a great leader. And, and just so that this is out of the way, you know, all the drama that's surrounding Peyton right now with the you know University of Tennessee allegations and then the stuff with the HGH, if there's any guy that deserves the benefit of the doubt, at least a little bit, it's Peyton Manning, I think. You know, I think every guy deserves to have that. You know, you, you, need, you, need, you need to take treat him fairly like you would anybody else, but... This guy has proven over the course of his entire career that he is just one of the best leaders and honestly one of the best people in the game. Uh, definitely a role model for future players. Yeah, and uh, let's not forget uh, off the football field the kind of impact that he's made. Yep. I know, uh, you know, f- me personally, I his acting, his comedy is, is fantastic. Yes. I whenever i'm bored i i flip on youtube and i watch his when he hosted snl i thought he was one of the best snl hosts ever he he has a a, a knack for for the, he has a comedic touch uh and whatever he decides to do in his his post career um i think acting or something like that comedy is is going to be a part of it yeah, I heard that mentioned today. Maybe him getting uh, involved in maybe some of the funnier, uh, funnier die uh, sketches, uh, something like that. You know, that could be uh, huge. But yeah, <laughs> I don't I don't think Peyton is going anywhere. Um, kind of back to the numbers, guys. First in three plus TD games. The number is ninety three. He had ninety three pl- three <laughs> or more yeah. TD games. That is crazy. That is absolutely mm-hmm. crazy. Um, so, but I mean, me personally, I have to admit, I was never really a huge Peyton Manning fan because rooting mm-hmm. for any Tennessee Volunteer was never in my blood as a Memphis Tiger fan. You know, they say Bret Hart was the excellence of execution. Well, Peyton Manning was even <laughs> bigger than that. Uh, seriously, he, like I said, he commanded the offense like nobody else, just masterful at breaking down defense on every single play. So even I'm taking a step back and feeling a bit sad for the future mm-hmm. of the NFL because we will most likely never see anyone with that level of excellence again. And, you know, kind of taking a step back, this is just about has to be the equivalent, the NFL equivalent of Michael Jordan retiring in the NBA, uh, if not pretty close. It's the closest thing for sure. And, and, you know, a lot of things too I'm thinking about, you know, think about how well he played following his neck surgery too. I mean, that's going to be something that maybe we might not think about all that much years in the future. Like, we're going to look, like, I always like to try to put myself 10, 15 years in the future and think back, okay, like, how are we going to think about this guy then? We remember now because it's so recent, but God, he played well after those neck surgeries. I mean, recently it wasn't great, but just the, the, how, how 
versatile and how how strong he was, how he that how he was able to uh, respond to adversity. I mean, the guy was. You're right. I mean, Michael Jordan in football, the closest thing at least. Yeah, and if not for the neck surgeries, I think he'd be right up there, uh, hanging in there with Tom Brady as well. Because yep. in 2013, he had 56 TDs. That was just three seasons ago. 56 TDs. That's incredible. So, uh, if you guys had to name maybe one of your favorite Peyton Manning moments, or or just what you kind of remember him for the most, or that moment that kind of sticks out to you as, wow, this dude's good, uh, what would be your favorite Peyton Manning moment, Dan? Uh, my, I, for, this is one's for Kyle, uh, and he oh. probably knows where I'm going to go with this, but oh. uh, the the AFC Championship game where... Uh-huh. Uh, um, you know the the Patriots had that lead. I actually I remember it. It was in the second quarter. I I shut the game off for for a little while. I actually took a nap, and I woke up in the fourth quarter and watched Peyton complete the comeback. And my my jaw dropped. I, that was I my whole time uh, talking football. You know Peyton versus uh, Brady. I've always stuck on the uh, the Manning side and. Brady always had the Super Bowl win, so I could never back it up with anything. But that game finally solidified, uh, you know, Manning's resume boosting win to to kind of put his critics uh, to rest. Yeah, he needed that. Uh, I definitely think he did. You know, it, it, I still think his playoff re- uh, resume is not great. But that being said, sure. he definitely that was that was a that was a trademark win. I have I have another one. Uh, this isn't of the highest stakes, but I just remember it distinctly as a Patriots fan. I mean, it was this was crushing. It was uh, back in 2009 against the Pats, where they had they were playing at home and they were down by I think like 13 points, and uh, they had like three minutes or so left, and they drove down the field, and he scored a touchdown. Ba- Patriots got the ball back, and then it was that infamous fourth down and two or fourth down and three play call by Belichick where he threw that. That out pattern to uh, to Kevin Falk right at the line of scrimmage, and they got stuffed at the at like maybe like the half yard line, and Peyton, then Peyton scored another touchdown. You know, I I mentioned that moment because it kind of uh, summarized I think how a lot of teams looked at Peyton Manning. I mean, the reason why I don't care what anyone says or what Belichick said at the time, the reason why he made that play call is because he knew that if he gave that ball back to Peyton Manning, even at his opposing. 20, 30 yard line, he had a high likelihood of driving the ball right back down the field and scoring again. So he felt, I need to get this first down because that's how we're going to win. I, we will not win if we give the ball back to Peyton Manning. And that that right there, that if you're so good at what you do that you can influence an opposing coach, a very good head coach to make a decision that bad, then you are something special. Yeah, no doubt. And honestly, ha- it don't a lot of teams do that facing yeah. New England as well? They you do, know, yeah. And same thing. Yeah, and you know, like I said, I, as a as a Patriots fan, I know I, I I see it when you know I see that all the time, and man, that that was crushing. That really was. <laughs> Well, allow me to play hater for just a second. Do it. Uh, one of my favorite Peyton Manning moments was when the Memphis Tigers beat Tennessee in the Liberty Bowl in <laughs> 1996. Not in the Liberty Bowl game, but in the Liberty Bowl Stadium, regular season game in 1996. Uh, the Tigers actually split with Peyton in his college career, one and one. Peyton got it, got them in 94, but uh, Memphis got their revenge in 1996. But the fact that it that is one of my most memorable mo- moments also goes to show how great Peyton was. That Memphis actually beat the great Peyton Manning once. Even if it was just once, it was one of the most memorable games uh, still to this day in Memphis Tiger football history. And I'll also remember that day. It was one of the biggest days in my life as far as, as, far as sports go because it was the same night of Tyson and Holyfield Part 1. Not the ear-biting fight, but the fight before that, that Holyfield won. Um, so that was just a huge night of sports. Uh, and I just that was one of the most memorable things uh, that I can remember and definitely kind of uh, always like to go back and kind of stuck it uh, stuck it to Peyton Manning uh, at least if it was just one time but also really my is to keep it positive my f- most favorite Manning moment I guess was him winning Super Bowl 50 and riding off mm-hmm. into the sunset with two Super Bowl wins just like his Bronco great mentor John Elway so I just think that was a very cool thing yeah agreed uh I'll ask you guys this. I, I was thinking about this today. 
where do you guys have them overall? You know, I think that's kind of the conversation that we always tend to have, and it's done by every every sports website, every pundit, everyone does it. But I'm curious, you know, top five quarterbacks of all time, where do you guys have them? I mean, I, he's he's the best regular season quarterback ever. Yeah. Um, but if you play some all time, everything included, uh, I mean, he's he's he would be third on my list. I mean, he might not have the the Super Bowl titles like like a Brady, but you know his two I think does give him more legitimacy towards towards being that. But I I have him uh, third behind behind Brady and Montana. Yep, same with me. Same exact order. Yeah, it's and I, I kind of agree with you guys. If it wasn't for the championships of Brady, uh, I, I'm gonna have I'm gonna have Montana one just because that was that was just uh, when I was growing up. That was just the thing, the 49ers. Um, it, but if it wasn't for the championships that Brady has, then I would put Peyton uh, number two just because, like I said, the level of excellence that he commanded. And to be honest with you, he didn't always have the clout or the guys around him that Brady has had over the years. And he also, you know, no disrespect to some of the Colts coaches, um, but you know, having Belichick on your side, I think, has really done uh, wonders for uh, Tom Brady and just having that consistency year Absolutely. in and year out. And they they pull off magic every single year uh, with some of their free agent pickups and through the draft as well. Uh, so. Yeah, I would agree. Definitely top five, no lower than three for sure. Uh, with Montana, of course, being one. But uh, if I, if if you, if they were coming out the same year, Brady and Peyton Manning coming out of the draft in the same year, and even to this day, if I had to pick one of them to start my franchise for the next say fifteen years, I'm probably picking Peyton Manning over Tom Brady. Yeah, I'm I'm definitely with you there. The way I look at it, if you gave Manning Belichick, Manning would be the better quarterback. Yeah, I, I'm a Patriots fan, and I can admit that. I, I think there's something to be said for, you know, Matt Castle comes in that one season, gets 10 wins, and every other mediocre quarterback that tried to go and fill Peyton, Man- Peyton Manning's role in the Colts did not succeed. I mean, I think there's definitely something to be said for that. Pey- Peyton Manning was that Colts offense. Tom Brady was the most important part of the Patriots offense, but he was not the offense. The offense was the coaching. Yeah. Um, you know, that definitely matters. It was a well-oiled machine yep. um, that, that was just kept on rolling. So let's move on and talk some more Broncos news. We're going to move, transition into NFL free agency now. And Brock Eisweiler, um, and, and I mentioned at the top of the show that uh, the shape of the franchises are about to change in a lot of cases, I and mean, your Super Bowl champs are no exception. The Broncos have a big decision to make, although I don't think there really is a decision to make here. I think you have to re-sign Osweiler. Uh, otherwise, you don't have a quarterback. You, there's no other quarterback currently on the roster. Uh, so so what do you guys think? Brock Osweiler, wh- what's going to happen? I think ultimately it's going to depend what the what the price tag is. I, I completely agree the Broncos should look to re-sign him. But if he's going to be demanding the type of money that supposedly I've heard rumors that he's going to he's going to try and command close to fifteen mil a year, uh, there's no way that that would be justified in my mind. Yeah, uh, so three, if he, three years for forty five million is what I saw. Yes. Today. So I mean, if he's commanding that that kind of number, um, I would personally let him walk. Um, there are some other options as a stopgap. I don't think Osweiler is going to be necessarily the answer. I don't think he's going to be bringing them another championship anytime soon. Um, so if you look at a guy like probably somebody else we're going to be talking to, RG3, um, if you can get him cheaper or something like that. Um, but number one, you look to re-sign him, but if he does command that too much too much money, I would let him walk. Did you uh, guys happen to see that TMZ report with Osweiler that happened Showing over the weekend? lady. Yeah. yeah, he shoved the lady, but then the guy pushed him, and he was able, able to avoid a, a fight all while holding a pizza box aloft and keeping the pizza safe. <laughs> Man, that guy, you know, he has good hands. I, mean, I can tell you, that pizza was, seemed pretty fine at the end. Uh, you know, I, I he's not worth what the money he's going to demand, and he's going to demand it, so I don't see him going back to the Broncos. I, 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 I think they should try to keep him, but, Dan, I'm with you. I, I just don't see why they would pay him as much as he's probably going to demand on the on the open market. I, I, I could see a bunch of teams. You know, I could see a team like the Texans paying up to get somebody like him, you know, which I don't think would be a bad fit necessarily. I think you pair him up with DeAndre Hopkins. He has that elite wide receiver to throw the ball to. Definitely not a bad place for him to go. I think he probably needs that. Um, uh, he's not the kind of guy that's going to make thing ha- things happen on his own, but he's proven this year. I mean, 2,000 yards passing, 10 touchdowns, you know, 86.4 passer rating in eight games. 
good player. You know, he he played well. He's a good fit for the team. He, he knows the offense, the system. I, I I'd like to see him stay with the Broncos. I just don't know if they can make it happen. Yeah, in in my opinion, is I think it's just too risky to do anything else but resign Osweiler because this you have a Super Bowl defense right now, and do you really want to be starting over at a key position at like quarterback right now? Because I think you have a two to three year window with this defense right. uh, that you could continue winning Super Bowls, and to start over at a position like quarterback, I think is just too risky. Now, uh, as Dan mentioned, fifteen million dollars a year. First of all, uh, is he worth that? No, I definitely don't think so. Uh, it's it, you know the jury's still out though. Honestly, I don't know how good he is going to be, and also I'm not sure that the Broncos could even afford that. But what are your other options? Do you want to draft a quarterback and start over with a rookie? Do you want to put it in the hands of someone like an RG three that could be risky as well? I guess you could pull off a trade, um, you know, someone uh, maybe like a Nick Foles or someone like that. I don't know, um, but I just. Unless someone else offers him stupid money, I see the Broncos uh, resigning him. And I, I kind of circled one team that you just mentioned, uh, Kyle Houston. I circled yep. them as a possible landing destination. But also, we're going to talk about the next guy, RG3. I kind of had him possibly going to Houston as well, which I didn't wouldn't think would be a bad move for Houston. But uh, it's, just, it's just my opinion. I think that the Broncos need to re-sign Osweiler. And uh, and maybe negotiate him uh, just in the in the circumstances of hey look you got a really good chance to win a Super Bowl with us this year you know we can't can't give you exactly what you're wanting right now but just be patient with us and uh, and your time will come for sure and then we'll see what happens but I think you you definitely need to keep this core together and not rock the boat any more than you have to because you're not going to be able to pay all those defensive guys as it is to begin with so. Um, so uh, Broncos could be reshaping in front of our very eyes over the next month, month and a half or so. So let's move on to RG3. Uh, and I do, I really want to see him start somewhere. I really do because I think there was just too many instability issues with the franchise in Washington between Mike Shanahan, Dan Snyder, drafting cousins in the same freaking draft. Uh, I just don't <laughs> think that was fair to RG3 from the get-go. Now, his injuries definitely um, hampered his progress and his future negotiations for larger contracts. And I definitely think he has some uh, gaps in his game, but I also think he was a very good that rookie year and then after that uh it was just a a dumpster fire in washington really surprised they made the playoffs this year but again we've talked about the division was just pretty poor so texans need a quarterback and uh uh, you know, you could if you're the Texans, you can never have too many QBs on staff because nothing you have done has worked out very well for you as of late. And uh, Cleveland, what else do you have to lose if you're a Cleveland uh, and bring RG3 in? I just I think he's going to get a chance somewhere. I don't think he's going to be demanding a whole lot of money because of just the last the way the last three years have played out. Uh, and I just I want to see him start somewhere, go somewhere where he can have a true legitimate chance at starting. Yeah, uh, yeah, uh, I, I, I'm, I'm you. pretty I, sure I you will get that chance. Kind of um, no chance to bounce back here. Oh, you go ahead, Dan. Yeah, I, uh, I, I, the one team that I see a fit for him is uh, uh, the the LA Rams. I think that would be a that would be a great team that would get him. Um, and it's, it would actually be kind of ironic because that's also the team that uh, you know made that trade with Washington uh, when they moved up in the draft to number the number number two overall position to get RG three. I think it would be kind of ironic a few years later they they release him and then uh, the now LA Rams pick him up for for him to be their starting quarterback. But I think with their offense, the way their scheme is set up, they have a solid run game. They have. Uh, you know some quick athletes on the outside. Uh, I think he could fit very well in with that with that system. Yeah, I, I'm with you, Dan. I, I have him. I have him in LA as well. I think that's a good spot for him for sure. I mean, and I mentioned this. I mentioned this before when we were talking about Janoris Jenkins. I think one of the underspoken aspect of uh, the, the LA Rams is they're moving to LA. You know, you I think getting a guy like RG3, a name, you know, to be your leading quarterback. That's a guy that you know. Looks pretty good on the programs, you know. He's he, he's definitely. he's a you know what I mean. Like I think that's, that's, that's definitely exactly. Yeah. yeah, that's the point. You know, he's he and he's going to. I think he plays alongside a guy like Todd Gurley who can take off a lot of the a lot of the load from him. He doesn't have to do everything. Um, you know, it's it's going to be good for him. I also have a possible landing spot for him to be the 49ers, too, because I just think that Chip Kelly might think he can do something with him, and mm-hmm. it doesn't seem to like Kaepernick all that much. So you know, I I could see Chip Kelly being the guy like. 
being thinking to himself, you know, I can rejuvenate this guy's career. And uh, I, either place I think would work. I think I'd like the L.A. Rams the most, though. Yeah, I like what you guys are saying as far as being in L.A. and and just the uh, the impact there as far as Hollywood glitz and glamour. And I think this guy still has appeal like that. So let's just let's just play on that for a minute. What happens to Nick Foles? Do you guys still see Nick Foles as a starting quarterback in the NFL? Uh, no, he's a, he's a solid backup. You know, I think he can he can make a nice living um, out of a backup. But I think we saw in St. Louis early this season what he really is. Uh, I, mean, I know he had that one year with the Eagles where he kind of came out of nowhere. Um, you know, as Michael Vick's replacement, but. Uh, I, I don't see him sustaining any type of lengthy starting NFL career. Yeah, I'm with you. Yeah, no, no, not for Foles. He's definitely a good backup. He's he's a solid guy you'd want there to you know plug in if you need him to you need know, him play some uh play some games. But he's not going to be a he's not a viable starter. If you want to be a legit team and wants to make the playoffs, he's not going to be the guy. All right, so let's move on to the NFL free agent running backs. And I've never seen a class like this. And we mentioned breaking news right off the top of the show. And we just learned that uh, Adam Schefter is reporting that the Tennessee Titans have acquired DeMarco Murray from the Eagles. So first off, guys, and as a Titans fan, I think you guys know that I've just been uh, desperately wanting them to make a move. I really don't care what it is. Address your running back situation, and I think they might have just done that. What do you guys think about that that pairing? You know, being a Cowboys fan, I've uh, I've watched uh, Murray a lot throughout his career. Um Obviously, the the Philadelphia situation didn't work out well for him. I don't think he was the best fit for that system. He's not a East West runner, um, kind of like Chip Kelly's system has you do uh, in the shotgun. He's more of a North South guy. He goes right uphill. Um, so I, it's it's going to be remain to be seen. It's going to depend on what the type of system the Titans run. I know I caught a few Titans game last year, and Mariota spent a lot of time in the shotgun, and that that would concern me off the bat because he's not that type. He needs uh he needs a couple steps to get going. So the single back one cut formation is the type of formation that fits him best. So I think that's where he's going to have the best role. Um, so I thought maybe even a reunion with the Cowboys would have been a possibility. Um, obviously the Eagles don't want to trade within the division, um, but it's going to, it's going to depend on the type of offensive uh, system that they're going to, stick to in Tennessee and I think you'll be able to speak on that a little bit more Brandon well yeah and I think traditionally they are more of a pro set style uh, but I've said this time and time again going into last year they had no running backs right. uh, I, uh, Dan I think you were maybe kind of high on Cobb um, coming out yeah coming out of the draft last year he, he looked pretty good but he got hurt early and I don't think he ever was able to really pick up the system too well Mm -hmm. And the year before, they drafted Bishop Sankey, which I thought was a huge mistake. You could have had Carlos Hyde, which I think would have been a better, just just a better yeah, NFL yeah. pro. Um, and Antonio Andrews, you know, Dexter McCluster, I like him, but more of you know, kind of a scat back to pass out out of the backfield, not necessarily your every down running back. Uh, so I just they had no running backs to me at all last year. So I think that may have uh, contributed to a little bit more shotgun uh, out of the Titans offense and what you should typically see. Uh, so maybe that will change, and hopefully that will change. And now you're looking at possibly Laramie Tunsil with the number one pick in the draft. You have your running back now, so I think you're going to see quite a bit of a style change in Tennessee uh, with this trade for DeMarco Murray. Kyle, yeah. what do you think? Yeah, actually, real quick, too, uh, another thing that just came through on my phone is that apparently Murray sought out the Titans specifically. Uh, and, he, I, and I like that. You you love that if you're a Titans fan. Right, yeah. I mean, that, so that, I mean, if Dan, you are mentioning before about the system, Maybe he's not worried about the system. I mean, I think maybe, he just wanted to go to a place with no competition. I'm I, think, I'm, I don't think he liked the Eagles' backfield last very year. True. Ryan yeah. Matthews, he didn't like that. So I, I don't actually like that he sought out the Titans. I think that's kind of a cop out. I, you know what? I, I'm not. I'm not saying I like it either. I'm just saying that might might bode well for him willing to play along. I don't know. We'll right, see. Right, yeah. 
Well, he will be the man in Nashville. He will. He will, he will be the man. And that, like I said, Dan, that, that style will change. They will mold more to fit DeMarco Murray than to uh, Marcus Mariota. I can guarantee you that. So I don't think it's a bad. He'll definitely be more productive than he was in Philadelphia. No matter what style Agreed. you run, no matter what happens in, in Tennessee, it's going to fit DeMarco better than what uh, the Philadelphia Eagles did last year. So I like it. I love it. Uh, man, and, and we, I was going to mention some of these other running backs. Doug Martin, Matt Forte, Arian Foster, Lamar Miller, Chris Ivory, Chris Johnson, LeGarrette Blunt, all free agents. Have you ever seen more impact uh, uh, running backs that have come up for free agents at one time? And just real quickly, guys, Doug Martin, second in the rushing in the NFL last year. Matt Forte was 11th. Lamar Miller was 13th. Chris Ivory was 5th. Chris Johnson was 17th. LeGarrette Blunt was 26th. Arian Foster only played four games, so I uh, can't really take anything out of that. But you know what is that about six guys all in about the top 25 in rushing last year could be seeing or could be heading to new destinations this this off season. Yeah, that seems yeah, to be the case. Yeah, I think you're going to also see uh, the the way the landscape in the NFL is because I don't expect any of those guys to hit big paydays. Mm-hmm. I think they're all going to be struggling to to seek more than three four million dollars a year. Um, so I Even think Doug Martin. Oh yeah, Martin. I think Martin might get something. I, I don't see him getting more than maybe four or five. I think I really do. I think the NFL is, is changing in, in what they dish out to, to free agent running backs. Uh, I think they look at him more of a dime a dozen where you can pick somebody in the draft who hasn't had as much wear and tear on their body. I mean, if you look at Doug Martin's work, uh, I mean, he's, he's had a lot of touches in the last few years, so mm-hmm. his yeah. wear and tear is getting up there. Um, That's a fair point. I don't think many people realize that he was second in the NFL in rushing last year. I do only because I had him on my fantasy team, and I I, I rode that. But uh, there's definitely there's going to be some some changing of of teams. Uh, I think the the sleeper out there is actually going to be Matt Forte. I know he has a lot of, uh, like I said, a lot of wear and tear on on his body, but he's versatile enough so he can impact a game not only running but in the receiving game. And he's a, he's a solid blocker, so you're going to still even at his age be able to keep him out there for three downs. Um, and I would like him. Uh, to join the Cowboys, um, you know, have a nice uh, timeshare with uh, Darren McFadden so you can keep him fresh. Um, I know it's two aging running backs, so I do want them to uh, look in the draft for, for a third guy. Um, but I, I would like him uh, running behind that Dallas offensive line. Uh, I think he can find holes and impact the game in multiple ways. Yeah, one of the more dynamic running backs we've seen over the last several years for sure. Yeah, definitely. I mean, he's he's definitely one of those one of those do everything kind of running backs. You know, I, Doug Doug Martin. You mentioned before, you know, he he's he's not m- much of a pass catcher. So I think you need to get him to a, a team. You know, he said Charles Sims for a while who, near here in Tampa, who's been a very good pass catching catching running back. So I, I mean, you mentioned before, uh, I I could see him fitting in Dallas. I, I can tell by the way you talk about Doug Martin, you don't really want him all that much, Dan, but. You know, I think that he would fit well in that. Co- I, I think he's best suited for a committee. I don't think he views himself as a committee back, and I don't think he's going to demand. I think he's going to try to demand, um, you know, the like sole uh, running back money. Uh, but he, you know, he's. I think he would fit pretty well in Dallas. He got a guy like Lance Dunbar to catch the ball a little bit. You know, I, I could see, I could see it working. Um, I also marked him down for Tennessee, but that's not going to happen now with mm-hmm. Tampa, oh, the with uh, Demarco Murray. You know, but yeah, Matt Forte, nope. Matt Forte. good. <laughs> yeah, he, he, I don't blame you. Yeah, you're you're good. Um, Matt Forte, I, I, one of the teams I I put him on there though. Uh, I have him on there possibly going to New England. I mean, I, one of the things coming out with Matt Forte was the idea that he wants to play for a contender. New England's the best contender you can go to right now that you could say has some some potential need for a running back. So that would work. Yep, agree. So, and lastly, from this running back core, guys, what do you think about Arian Foster? Is he done? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, I think you're, a team's going to give him a chance. They're not going to completely, you know, not give him an invite. They're going to want to kick his tires. But ultimately, it, his health has proved to be his downfall. And unless he can, you know, his his vegan diet is obviously not working. Um, yeah. So, so, so he needs to he needs to get in there and and prove that he can handle a little bit of a workload. And I don't know if we're ever going to see that again. Yeah, yeah, I, I, yeah. I don't think he should go in as a number one option for any team, but someone, uh, probably half the league, would take a flyer on him because you just never know if he 
if he did stay healthy, then he's going to be a very dangerous player. But man, just the, the past is just. Uh, the Texans have just ran into so many problems over the last couple of years with him going down and not having a quarterback at all. So uh, who, who knows? Uh, I'm, I'm close to the edge of saying that he, he is done. I'd like to see him just get a fresh start somewhere and then determine if he is done or not. Yeah, I will say I, I was a little surprised by the, that, that, that move on the Texans part, though. I mean, What else do you have? I mean, you're, you're going to – I'm assuming they're going to go after one of these free agent running backs because you're not going to find your success with Alfred Blue – and no. Chris Polk. It's not going to be those guys. So, is it Aaron Foster? I mean, I have a soft spot for Aaron Foster because I, I like to think that I discovered him. You know, I I had during his first breakout year, I had I had looked at stats. I'm like, this guy's going to be great. And I drafted him in fantasy, and he brought me to a championship, and it was awesome. But you know, he it's it's sad to say, but he's definitely more fitted for a committee type role. I actually one of the places I marked him down for would not be a bad spot, depending on how the, the whole uh. The Sean McCoy situation breaks out, but maybe Buffalo. You know, there's definitely some other backs there to kind of take the workload off him, like Carlos Williams might not be a bad fit. And they usually do that in Buffalo, right, Dan? Run at least a couple of different quarterback scheme. They've done that recently with you know, Fred Jackson kind of coming out of nowhere and yeah. Uh, yeah. that's an option. Um, and, you know, this is what I did at the beginning of this fantasy year. This is how much little faith I had in Arian Foster. I drafted Alfred Blue, you know, late rounds, but I drafted, I picked up Alfred Blue because I knew Arian Foster was going down, and um, after watching Hard Knocks, I, maybe I, I <laughs> gave a little bit more stock to Alfred Blue uh, than it was worth. I really, because he's a big back, I really liked him, but he just didn't. He was just sluggish in games and never did anything. But uh, I knew Foster was going to go down. He eventually did, and Alfred Blue did absolutely nothing for me. So I was disappointed there. But um, you know, I think a lot of these guys uh, will demand, like uh, like Dan said, you know, three to five million. And um, your top guys out there, of course, uh, Peterson's right at fourteen million, and Lynch at twelve million. Uh, I don't think any of those guys are demanding that type of money, but I think all of them could make differences on their new teams. Uh, so we'll see what happens. Again, a lot of teams are going to be changing shape right in front of our eyes. Another guy to talk about real quickly is going to be Antonio Gates. He is a free agent, been a long time. Or has was he drafted by San Diego guys? Has he ever played for another team? I think he was, he was undrafted, undrafted free agent. He signed with them. Uh, he got a camp deal because in college he played basketball, so he, he yeah, went to Kent State right. for basketball. Uh, and then he, yeah, I think he signed as an undrafted free agent with the Chargers. Yeah, he's been a lifetime Charger. Yep, I, I, I like him in New England. I could see him going there. I thought that would please Kyle. I think Kyle may have other ideas, but I, the, here's the reason I like him in New England is because they did just release Scott Chandler, and they used the tight end pretty heavily in, in half for a while. So I think Gates can still contribute, and if he's looking to win a Super Bowl late in his career, well, you know Brady's going to get you there eventually. If you're there, if, if you spend another two to three years in New England with Tom Brady, chances are fairly high that you're going to go to at least one Super Bowl. So I just think that would be a, a pretty good match. Uh, Kyle, so what what do you think? I know you like that move, but what do you what do you see as far as Gates and his new destination? Well, just on the New England, I definitely like the move, and the more you've thought, the more we've talked about it, the more I feel like it makes sense too. Just because I like the idea of having another Scott Chandler was fine, was fine, but you know Antonio Gates would be nice to get a little bit of the attention off of Gronk because I every time Gronk is on the field, I can't help but be worried that he's going to get hurt again. So I, I would like a guy like Antonio Gates to take some of the attention away from him. A team that I kind of saw for him that's an option that might actually work for him might be the Jets, though, who are, I think of all the teams in the NFL might be might need a tight end the most. And to be honest with you, I, I, I that that trio of, of uh, pass catchers, Gates, Marshall, and Decker, that's pretty lethal. I mean, I, I, if I was if I was the Jets, I would really like the idea of having that, seeing what the potential they could do if you know they have Ryan Fitzpatrick there and and. and uh, and those three guys, I mean, they're pretty, they were pretty deadly. Just, just a uh, Marshall and Decker, Decker by themselves. You add Gates to the mix. You got somebody going across the middle. I mean, it, I like it. Definitely, Dan. Yeah, I, uh, I, I just want Gates to resign with San Diego. I just, I like the guys who spend uh, their entire career with one organization. I don't think he has many years left. Uh, I know he has. Uh, the NFL record with Philip uh, Philip Rivers, the most uh, touchdown passes from a quarterback to a tight end. So just just keep adding to that. I, I think Rivers definitely wants him back. Um, you know, he's one of his most reliable targets. Uh, knows the system. Um, so I would like to see San Diego um, cough up a little dough and, and re-sign him. I don't think it's going to take too much too much money, but uh, no. um, I would like to see him stay a lifelong Charger. 
Speaking of yeah. money, I have a more I have some more breaking news because this this show is already so huge. Huge breaking. Uh, we actually have a deal that just came through for uh, Dwayne Allen with the co- the Colts. Uh, he received a four year, twenty nine point four million dollar contract, which pays him twelve million in year one and a total of seventeen million in year two. So you're talking about money. The boy just got paid. And that means probably goodbye to Kobe Fleener because he was uh, he was another free agent that they had, and uh, I don't think they're going to be dishing out money to two tight ends. Yeah, yeah, that's that's pretty big money. Uh, what is Fleener going to do without his boy Andrew Luck? They've been together for a <laughs> long time, uh, Stanford boys together. So wow, that's that's pretty big money for, um, for a marginal Allen. talent, marginal talent too. I mean, he's he's not he's fine. He's he's a starting tight end. He's he's not. Twenty nine point four million. My God. Well, and again, uh, we're talking about New England and how they use the tight ends heavily and could use two on the field at all times. Indianapolis is not really that type of team because uh, I thought Fleener would have a bigger impact when Luck came in. Uh, he just they don't really look for the tight end, per, you know, heavily. So um, yeah. they could have spent that money on their defense too. I mean, I, yeah. I, I'm the more I'm offensive thinking about line, this, protecting Andrew. Yeah, Luck. offensive line. Yes. Oh my God. What? A, yes. And you know, what? I'll tell you what, Brandon. This is uh, these Titans, man. They get Larry Tunsil. They got Demarco Murray, who's going to be, you know, the best running back in the league again. I mean, this this is already a weak division. I mean, this I don't know the Colts. That that move is is very confusing to me. I don't know what they're trying to do. I thought you knew. Hey, we got <laughs> we got a new GM, you know, and he seems to be he seems to be doing his part, and um, and I, I, that's what I like. And yeah. I, again, I was I was not in favor of letting Wisenhunt go. To me, it was the GM all along. You know, you got to give them talent. I, pretty much every sport team and every sport league is the same. Uh, coach is only as good as the talent he has on the field or on the court, and you got to get some talent around a uh, coach to have them have any success. So, um, yeah, I, I liked Wizen Hunt, but anyway, what's in the past is what's in the past. I'm just glad to see the new guys doing his job and making a splash in free agency. Re- or, well, not really free agency, but making a splash, period. We'll see what they do in free agency. Hopefully it's just um, a sign of more things to come. Uh, let's move on. One more name, uh, Kalichi Osimile, uh, one of the hottest O-line commodities in the offseason. I'm projecting he'll get around ten million a year. What do you guys see uh, from Kalichi Osimile uh, currently with the Baltimore Ravens? And uh, also, what I heard is the Ravens really wanted to keep him. I just don't think it's going to work out. He's going to be too sought after to keep him. Yeah, you say he's one of the, he's one of the, you said you said that he's one of the best offensive linemen. He's he's probably the best offensive lineman in free agency right now. Guy who can guy who likes to play guard mostly, but can play a little bit of tackle as well. A great yep. run blocker. Uh, you know, on, I, on either side of center too, he has played just about every position in the offensive line. Very versatile, and I think that he's the kind of guy that you know he'll he'll get that paycheck, and it won't be with the Ravens. I heard something that might uh, end up going to the Dolphins as a potential fit. Um, but you know, I, I, if they can afford him, that'd be nice. I heard they're also going after a couple other free agents, but we'll have to see what happens there. I also saw that possibly the Eagles and the Raiders want him, from what I've read. So I'm, sh- I'm sure there's going to be about s- six to ten teams courting a similar. Yeah, I definitely. Uh, I think the Raiders would be the smart choice. Uh, you know, protect David Carr for uh, uh, Derek Carr. Oh man. Derek Carr for years to come. I think that would be the smart move. You know, they, they have a solid uh, solid defense, a young group of receivers, a uh, nice running back to shore up that offensive line. I actually think you can see Oakland being a, uh, a playoff caliber team next season. So we'll see. Again, I'm sure there's going to be a lot of teams courting him, and he's probably safe to say he is about to get paid. Mm-hmm. So, I don't, Kyle, Dan, is there any more breaking news I've missed in the past <laughs> five minutes in the NFL? Not that well, I can we'll, think we'll, of. We'll move on, I guess. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, this is the time of year when uh, the franchises are changing shapes and, um, and, and moving ahead, looking into the next year with free agency and, of course, trades and uh, retirements and all kinds of things. So uh, that is your NFL news for this show. We're going to move on now to the NCAA Bubble Watch. You are listening to the My Fantasy Podcast from MyFantasySportsTalk.com. Brandon Reed, Dan Schalk, and Kyle Kirby here. Transitioning into the NCAA Bubble Watch, we have three teams that we're going to break down 
In this week's segment, we are only six days away from NCAA Selection Sunday, so it's getting real, folks. And the first team we want to talk about is Texas Tech. They are 19-11 and 11 overall, 9-9 nine and nine in conference, and what an up-and-down season. They started 11-1 and one, then lost seven of their next eight. Um, uh, that stretch, they played five ranked teams, though, including Kansas at number one and then Oklahoma at number one, and their strength of schedule is number one. Uh, Ken Palm has them at 36. I like Tubby Smith, top-notch coach nationally. Uh, I don't know if you guys saw this recently on Senior Day. Uh, Todrick Gotcher proposed to his girlfriend on Senior Night. Uh, which is a moment I could see being played over and over in the tournament as You're long right. as Texas Tech is a part of it. That's just one of those things. And uh, I think this team is prepared for the NCAA tournament. I have Texas Tech in. I'm with you. I have him in as well. I think uh, the job that Tubby Smith has done in his uh, short stay in Lubbock has, has been uh, quite remarkable. I know uh, Pat Knight, Bob Knight's son, uh, brought that program down uh, to basically shambles. Uh, so to see them um, in, a, in a short amount of time, you know, resurrect themselves to a to a tournament team is is pretty remarkable. But yeah, I mean, with you look at their strength of schedule first, RPI they're twenty sixth. I think uh, the committee will look uh, at them as a Big Twelve team. You know, nine wins yep. in the Big Twelve alone, I think, will show um, that they are worthy of a of a spot. Yeah, I agree. A strong conference. Uh, you know, last uh, four of their last six games with wins here, including a win over Oklahoma, which is pretty good. And they played uh, Kansas to within 10 on the road, so I kind of like that too. Uh, you know, they got a very soft matchup going up against TCU for their last game here coming up on Wednesday. So I like their, I, I like, I like their potential. I, I definitely have them in. All right, so we agree. Pitt is our next team, 20 and 10, nine and nine in uh, conference play. Pitt is on the right side of the bubble, uh, based to me, basically on good losses. Six of their ten losses have come against the top 15. Uh, strength of schedule is 35, RPI 44. This is an experienced team with size. Uh, they, they are uh, they have are averaging right now 17 assists per game, which is uh, fairly high. Uh, James Robinson is a great senior floor leader, leading the league in assists, and of course Jamie Dixon is a very good season coach. I just believe this team is worthy of an NCAA berth. I have them in uh, from the ACC. Yeah, I, uh, I have them in right now. I think a lot of it is going to depend on on the uh, the ACC conference tournament. Um, you know, their first matchup is actually against the the team that we're going to pr- talk about next, and that's Syracuse. Um, uh, both of those teams bubbled. Uh, being on the bubble is going to hinge on that game, whether they make it or not. So I think the winner is most likely in, although I think Cuse might need a little bit more help. Um, you know, Pitt, they, they're, they're 6 and 9 in their last 15 games. Um, so they, they definitely need some help. Um, but uh, yeah, I right now I have them in. Yeah, I have them in too. Um, you mentioned before, Brandon, about having good losses. I mean, I think this is the team that exemplifies that. Eight of its last, eight of its thirteen overall losses came against teams in the top twenty-five. So, that I like that. I like that number there. I mean, I think that's kind of a good, a good sign for a good team. They 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 lose to the good teams, but they beat the teams that are they should beat, and that's kind of what you want from these teams that are going to be in the tournament here. Um, I, I think they should be. I, I think they're in even if they lose to Cuse, to be honest with you. But I think they clinch. They definitely clinch the spot with a win. Um, you know, good some good wins. Uh, they actually had that win against Duke a little while ago. So, you know, I I, I like their I like their chances. I got them in. Yep, and the ACC is just so tough. If it you is. play in that deep league, uh, I don't think there's any really bad teams in the league. Uh, so, well, let's move on to Syracuse, and that is going to be a huge game to open up the ACC conference tournament play. Syracuse is 19 and 12, 9 and 9 in the ACC as well. Uh, Michael Benage, and I think I'm pronouncing his, his name right, Benage, um, he's one of the best players in the ACC, and we all know Trevor Cooney, who's been there, it seems like, forever, another great uh, Cuse senior. And I'm afraid the NCAA tournament hopes came to an end Saturday night at Florida State. I just I don't like that loss, and they seem to be trending uh, down and not really having a whole lot of momentum going into the ACC tournament play against Pitt on Wednesday. So, in my opinion, they have uh, two wins. Uh, they need two wins in the tournament to get to 21 and 12 to get in. Their strength of schedule is 37, RPI is 52, and that's all good coming out of the ACC. 
Um, it's just I see them losing to Pitt on Wednesday. Therefore, they would have lost five of their last six and playing their way out. Now, I hope they make it because of um, you know Jim Beheim, uh, Benaje, and Cooney, and um, that that just that's a team you want to see in the tournament. I think could make some noise in the tournament, and Boheim will be. Uh, but I see the way I see it is uh, Beheim will be. The coach you see Sunday afternoon explaining and trying to rationalize why his team did not make it in the tournament. I see them as out. Yep, same here. I have them out. Um, they will. Uh, just with you, I think they need at least two tournament wins uh, in the conference tournament um, to really solidify themselves. Uh, you always want to see Syracuse in the tournament. With with Jim Beheim, you never know with the two three zone. I think it always uh, it can mess with teams, and they're always worthy of, of making a Sweet Sixteen appearance, even if they were, you know, they somehow managed to get in as a ten seed or something like that. Um, but with their resume, I I, I think their their last uh, the last few games with their losses, I have them out. Yeah, I got them out as well. I mean, I, I I'm with you, Dan. I think they need to win a couple games in the tournament here, and if they. If they don't win a couple games, they need to beat Pitt badly to be considered. And I, I just don't see that being. A, I don't see that happening. So I don't know. I, to be considered a chance, to be, to be considered a team going in, I think they need stuff like that. I mean, they lost to Pitt at home by like 14 points a couple weeks ago. I mean, just a lot of bad, ugly losses. This is one of those. This is one of those things we talked about a lot with these bubble teams. I mean, what have you done for me lately? And this is a team that has not done anything. Uh, you know, a loss to Pitt on Wednesday clinch, clinches them being out, and uh, a, a, a big win gives them a chance. But they need a couple wins here in the tournament to be anywhere close. Yep, we all agree there, and it's a shame. I would like to see them because uh, really good senior backcourt with Cooney and, and Benaje, and of course uh, you get uh, Beheim in the tournament. No telling what he could do, and as Dan mentioned, that uh, two-three zone with those senior leaders, they could be a dangerous team. But, yeah, I see them losing to Pitt, and I just don't think that's going to be enough. Uh, I would like to talk about uh, some others now. Gonzaga, 24-7, and 15-3 and in the conference play. Strength of schedule is 129, not great in RPI of 62. But uh, in just a couple of hours, they play BYU in the West Coast Conference semifinals, and that is going to be at 11.30 Eastern time. Big, big game for both those teams. Could knock someone straight out of the big dance. Uh, 11.30 Eastern time. Dan, you staying up for it? Uh, no. <laughs> nope. <laughs> Sad, right sadly, answer. yeah, the, the uh, BYU doesn't doesn't get my fancy going too much. Um, but the loser of that game will definitely be out of the tournament. I, I don't see uh, if you can't make the final of your conference tournament when uh, you know BYU or Gonzaga, then you're probably going to be out. I, it's seems like every year Gonzaga is almost always a lock. They always have great records. They have solid players you've never heard of. Um, but they're going to have to win tonight in order to solidify themselves a spot. Yeah, agreed. That's one of the teams you got that, that needs something pretty big here to get themselves in there. Right now I'm looking at their overall ranking. They're ranked 64th. So, I mean, they're right on the precipice if you go by that alone. Uh, but, you know, they... Uh, they need something big here to get to finish this off. Uh, uh, overall championship in this uh, in their conference would be nice. That would definitely do it. Yeah, just kind of an underwhelming schedule for yeah. Gonzaga this year, uh, and that's not what typically you'd see out of Gonzaga team. So they've just been eh, pretty good this year. So any other teams that you're keeping an eye on, guys? Um, out of the the MAC conference, uh, Monmouth and Iona are actually playing uh, for the for the conference championship. And Monmouth is a team. If they don't win the uh, their conference tournament, they have a chance at an at large bid. Uh, they've beaten some some solid teams like uh, a USC, UCLA. Although they haven't had the, the resumes this season, uh, they're still pretty solid teams. And I I was able to uh, see Monmouth up close and personal. Uh, you know, covering the Canisius uh, Golden Griffins basketball games, they've got a, a guard Justin Robinson who uh, is a possible Player of the Year candidate. He's not getting a lot of love, obviously coming from Monmouth, but they have a they have a great team that I would not be surprised if they make a make a tournament run if if they do make it. Uh, and we talked dance. about them last week too, Dan, and I made a little bit of fun of Monmouth, but uh, I was yeah I was letting you uh, you know make a fool of yourself. <laughs> well, I totally did because I did. And traditionally, they're not a basketball powerhouse. No, not at all. Uh, 
Um, but after reviewing their resume today as well, man, they're a pretty good team. They are a pretty good team. Really fun to watch. High scoring. Great, great offense. Defense is their issue. Who else you got your eye on, Kyle? I got my eye on Alabama. Uh, that's a team that has some pretty nice wins over the course of the season. They got a win at Wichita State, nor Notre Dame, uh, going down the list, South Carolina, you know, they, Texas A&M. I mean, they had some pretty nice wins here. I mean, that, that's a team that should be able to make it in, but they just had some pretty bad losses too. I mean, especially recently. I mean, they've lost four of their last five, and now they have to make some sort of run here in the tournament to really give themselves a shot and to get into it. It's a team I like. I mean, I, I've seen only I – I I don't watch a ton of college basketball until around this time of the year, but it's a team I actually have caught a little bit of, and I like the way they play. You know, the record isn't good enough to get them in as of right now, so they need this run here in the tournament, but that's a team I have my eye on to possibly make some noise once they actually – once or if they actually get to the tournament. Yeah, the SEC has uh, a couple of different teams like that. Vanderbilt's kind of also in that uh, same category as well. Now, one of the conferences I'm kind of interested in is the Atlantic 10 tourney because you've got Dayton. Dayton is projected to be a lock right now. Um, still kind of up in the air, but uh, you got Dayton, VCU, St. Bonaventure, and St. Joseph's, all with similar resumes. And uh, tourney kicks off Wednesday, but it really gets interesting on Friday as all the four of those teams have buys to the quarterfinals. So I can't wait for this tournament because I love this as a basketball conference, even going back from the days of all the Temple and UMass throwdowns. So uh, very interested in watching that tournament, and we are almost there, guys. We're really about to get into some serious basketball starting Thursday, Friday over the weekend and leading into Selection Sunday. Also, like the Big East Tournament, Butler and Providence play in the 4-5 quarterfinal game on Thursday. I think that's one of your uh, losers is out of the tournament, uh, big dance, and the winner could be in. Almost identical records between those two teams, and uh, I think Providence has a slightly better resume. Uh, But this is going to be a great game, and I'm also keeping a close eye on this game, and Providence is because their head coach, Ed Cooley, has been mentioned for the Memphis job should that become available anytime soon. So uh, interesting there, although I don't see it because Cooley is actually born in Providence. Uh, so I think he's got to be living a dream right now. But uh, anyway, can't wait for the Atlantic 10 tourney, tourney and the Big East tourney. And we Big East is not what it used to be several years ago, uh, but that tournament always provides some magical moments uh, leading into Selection Sunday. So, uh, anything else you guys are keeping your eye on uh, as far as a bubble watch and leading into the tournament on our uh, Selection Sunday coming up in six days from now? I just have my eye on a whole lot of basketball because I plan on watching it. This is uh, the best time of year for college basketball, and I am Great up. greatly excited. Yep, this is the time Kyle really gets into it as well. Yes. Huh? <laughs> yes. So let's close out today's show. Again, you're listening to My Fantasy Podcast from MyFantasySportsTalk.com. This is Brandon Reed along with Dan Schalk and Kyle Kirby. We're about to bring you who we think are going to be the top four seeds come Sunday in the big dance. So I will let you guys start it off. Who wants to go first? Uh, I'll jump in. I have uh, Kansas. I think that they're the, going to be the number one overall seed. I think that's pretty much the only lock as the number ones. Yep. Um, I also have North Carolina, Villanova, and then my my fourth, I'm kind of split. I, on, uh, on the website today, I, I wrote a column on why Oregon um, is one of the most dangerous teams in the country and why they are deserving of a number one seed um, in the NCAA tournament. A lot of people don't give them a lot of love, but if you look at their resume, I mean, they have the second most um, top 50 wins with 10 of them. Um, the resume boosting um, wins basically up and down their, their schedule. Um dominating the Pac-12. Um, so right now, they're on the outside looking in because I don't think they're going to get a lot of love unless they win the Pac-12 conference tournament. If they do win that, then I have them as a number one. But if they don't, then Michigan State is my fourth number one seed. Yeah, the Pac-12 traditionally doesn't get a whole lot of love when it comes to number one seeds unless it's like um, you know uh, UCLA uh, on, on the odd years that they're really, really good. Mm-hmm. Kyle, who do you have? Yeah, I'll keep mine short and sweet. Kansas is the absolute lock, like Dan said. I got Villanova as well. A solid team with only one home loss. I mean, it's a pretty good squad there. And then the other two teams, I had a hard time debating between the two of them as well. I'm gonna go. I'm gonna go with Michigan State. They got pretty good road record, seven and three on the road, pretty good. You know, the one team I was looking at has potential of staying in there was Virginia, but I'm mean, looking at their road record right now, five and six, not that great. I mean, we'll see what they do in the tournament, but I definitely prefer Michigan State over them. 
And then for my fourth spot, I, I don't know. I kind of, I kind of like the idea of Oklahoma being there. I think I really like the Big Twelve as a conference. I think that would kind of be nice to have two representatives uh, in the top four there. Yeah, I agree. Between the Big Twelve and the ACC, definitely one of those is the better conference. The Big Twelve really stepped up this year. I really like that as a conference. And those Oklahoma and Kansas showdowns this year have just been amazing. Mm-hmm. That first contest uh, where Buddy Hield uh, had forty six in that three overtime game. Honestly, that was probably the best college basketball game I've seen in years, yep. uh, hands down. It just it was just an amazing game. So, uh, but I agree with you guys. Kansas is your lot for the number one overall seat. I also have Michigan State in. They're currently ranked two in the APP, uh, AP poll, um, three in USA Today. Uh, I have Villanova as another number one seed. They flip-flop with Michigan, ranked th- third in the AP and two in the USA Today. And then that last seed, uh, the last number one seed, I have Virginia, uh, basically because I think they have a better chance of winning the ACC tournament than Oklahoma has of beating Kansas in the Big 12 tournament. And that's basically the uh, the only reason I have Virginia slipping up or sliding in, because I think between Virginia and Oklahoma, it's going to be who performs better in their conference tournaments of who claims that last uh, number one seed. So, uh, to me, I just I think Virginia has a little bit better chance of doing that than Oklahoma does. But uh, between those teams, Kansas, Michigan State, Villanova, and Virginia, here's my spoiler, folks. My NCAA champion is not in that top four line. Uh, my NCAA champion is not one of those top four seeds I just mentioned. Kansas, Michigan State, Villanova, or Virginia. And I'll leave it at that because we're going to have more on that in next week's March Madness Bracket Break Cliffhanger. Show. Cliffhanger. What? There you go. You got to listen next week, folks. It's going to be got... huge. It's huge. huge. It's true. It's true. Uh, so tune in next week. That's going to be big. And I guess we'll start filling out our brackets Sunday night and giving you more on that next week and next week's show as the big March Madness Bracket Breakdown show uh, comes to you. So, uh, good show today, guys, and so much breaking as we're actually on the air. got to love it, right? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. This is what makes the best kind of uh, podcast, radio, whatever you want to call it. This is definitely the best kind of uh, way of doing this. And now we know the NFL offseason is in full swing. Yep. And now we know that Tennessee should not get a top five draft pick next year. That's that's what I'm predicting. Hopefully not. You, you draft Tunsil. You got DeMarco Murray today. You got one of the better young quarterbacks in the league. Tennessee is up on the rise. But, hey, folks, I want to just mention real quickly some of the stuff going on at MyFantasySportsTalk.com. We got some NFL news up currently for you. And, uh, Dan just posted the NFL salary cap figure, so definitely check that out to see where your team falls and how much money they got to afford. Draft po- tro- draft profiles uh, are going to be posted soon. Uh, Dan also just posted my man Paxton Lynch draft profiles. So that one is taking off and hot right now. And one of our newer writers, Colin Anderson, uh, recently uh, published a uh, article, All Hail Megatron, the Legacy of Calvin Johnson. You'll want to check that out. As far as NCAA news, um, Casey uh, Mossery breaks down Marshall in the Conference USA Tournament. And look for my American Athletic Conference Tournament preview on Wednesday as that tournament starts Thursday. Cesar Gutierrez is breaking down soccer like crazy, is he not, Dan? Oh, yeah, he's our he's our resident soccer expert. If you want uh, help with your fantasy soccer team, definitely read his columns. He's breaking down MLS like crazy right now, and, and, and so- soccer is kicking off uh, big time as uh, Cesar's going to bring you all that information, guarantee it. So check us out daily, myfantasysportstalk.com. And also want to mention Kyle is our reigning contributor of the month, breaking down everything from sports and entertainment. So uh, congrats, Kyle. I'm pretty sure he's going to be heading off the podcast to watch Raw and break that down for you, uh, you know very it. soon as well. So uh, just congrats, Kyle, and uh, check out all of our writers. We're doing big things here. It's huge, MyFantasySportsTalk.com. <laughs> You've been listening to the My Fantasy Podcast. Thanks so much for listening. This is Brandon Reed for Dan Shaw, Kyle Kirby. We will see you next week for the big March Madness Breakdown Show. Until then, see you later. MyFantasySportsTalk.com. <laughs>